First Timothy chapter two. First Timothy chapter two. <clears throat> We are working our way through the last half of this chapter. Last week we addressed God's standard for men in the public assembly. We focused specifically on their spiritual qualities while positioned in a posture of prayer. The gist for the men is that God has called men to be the ones who are leading the way spiritually. Then we moved into verses nine and 10. And we started talking about the role of women, starting with their godly character. Today we are going to continue to discuss the role of women within the life of the church. Let's pray together and let's get into this. Pray with me. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, as we just sang moments ago. Thank you for being such a faithful God. Great is your faithfulness. Lord, we sang a lot about your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful. Even when we are faithless, even when we fail you, how amazing for you, Lord Jesus, to say to uh, Peter, I pray that your faith fail not. <laughs> but we know that, Lord, you are the one who, that restored him because of your faithfulness to him. And so, Lord, in light of your faithfulness, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us today. Because you were always so faithful to give us exactly what we need, to teach us in a way, in exactly the way that we need. And Lord, you're looking down upon us right now. You're here among us because two or three are gathered in your name. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would just stir our hearts, God. Lord, because we know you are faithful, we want to be faithful to you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. We sang just moments ago, Lord. We want to hear that, those words on that day. And so, Lord, we just pray that we would abide faithfully in your presence, Lord God. That we would abide in the vine as you are bringing forth fruit in our lives. And today is just another opportunity for us to grow closer to you. And as was prayed moments ago, Lord, be more in love with you at this very moment. Lord, I pray that you would help us to love you. And Lord, I pray that as we draw close to you right now, our hearts would be warmed by the fire of your word. Oh God, that we would live faithfully and love you and serve you. And so Father, use this as just <clears throat> one more way of helping us to achieve Christ-likeness in our lives. Thank you for today, Lord, and prepare our hearts for communion later on, God. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. <clears throat> well, I am going to say at the outset, uh, I'm gonna give a bit of a disclaimer there is a possibility that something that I teach today is going to rub someone the wrong way. If we are Christians, <clears throat> I hope that we will allow the word of God to form and shape our way of thinking. I believe that the subject matter that I'm going to cover is clearly taught in the scriptures and there doesn't need to be division within the body of Christ about a woman's role in the local church. Let me also say that uh, what we covered last week and what we will cover today, I think, is very fitting in light of the great confusion that currently exists 
in our culture about gender distinction and gender roles. There is even some confusion in the church about the proper roles for men and women. And I hope that we can clear that up today. Now, outside the church, we have seen a seismic shift in the biblical, historical, and even scientific perspective on the subject of male, female gender roles. I mentioned a few times that National Geographic magazine devoted the entire January 2017 edition of their magazine to the subject of gender roles. The cover of that particular issue (coughs) features Avery Jackson, a nine-year-old transgender girl dressed in pink, staring proudly into the camera. The caption reads, special issue, gender revolution. And then this is followed by a quote by Avery Jackson. And the quote is, the best thing about being a girl is, now I don't have to pretend to be a boy. The editor in chief, writes in this edition of National Geographic. Today, beliefs about gender are shifting rapidly and radically. That's why we're devoting this month's issue to an exploration of gender in science, in social systems, and in civilizations throughout history. One of the first articles features advice from the American Academy of Pediatrics parents' website on discussing gender with your children. They advise parents to, and I quote, to ensure your young child's environment reflects diversity in gender roles and opportunities for everyone. They encourage parents to support their child's interests and talents, regardless of whether or not they match our society's perceived gender roles. They go on to urge parents that gender identity can't be changed by any interventions, although they note that some children who are gender non-conforming in early childhood grow up to become transgender adults and others don't, they say. And that parents need to make their homes havens of safety, unconditional love, and acceptance for who they are. There was another article in that magazine called Rethinking Gender. This article attempts to apply science to help us navigate the shifting landscape of gender. I didn't realize there was a shifting landscape of gender. I thought there was only two, but apparently there's a lot more now. And it looks at various gender disorders as well as the latest findings from neuroscience, including studies that suggest individuals who identify as transgender might have, and I quote, brains that most closely resemble brains of their self-identified gender than those of the gender assigned at birth. I bet you didn't know that when you were born, you were assigned a gender. It didn't mean you were actually that. Somebody else decided, "Hmm, yep, that's a boy, and wrote it down there on the birth certificate. The issue, this National Geographic issue, ends with an op-ed piece that suggests, once we recognize that gender identity and expression exist along a spectrum, why should we cling to the rigid characterization of men and women? Why do that when when there's a spectrum involved? The ultimate goal according to the magazine, surely is to let all people define themselves as human beings to break out of assigned categories and challenge received wisdom. Now, 
If you want to get angry, pick up a copy of that uh, magazine <clears throat> and read through it. You can still get it online. You can download it, I think. I found, I found a free copy online. Um, it's amazing. And sadly, what is considered by even a lot of our culture today, what is morally reprehensible and even shocking has become the new norm for so many people. Now, my purpose in bringing this up is not to spend time refuting the magazine articles from a biblical perspective. Maybe someday I'll take the time to go through the whole magazine and we'll take a few Sundays and do that. I'm not gonna do that today. But I'm simply showing that there is growing confusion over the roles of men and women, especially when we can't even de decide what is a man and what is a woman? But as heated as the battle over the gender issue can be in the secular world, there is also some disagreement within the body of Christ about the roles of men and women. One commentator said the following, the role of women in the church is a topic that is hotly debated today. Unfortunately, the debate has left the pages of scripture to find its resolution. The traditional doctrines are being swept away by the flood tides of evangelical feminism. Churches, schools, and seminaries are rapidly abandoning truths they have held since their inceptions. Dozens of books are being written defending the new truth regarding the role of women. Ironically, some of the authors of those books formerly held to the traditional biblical view. But under the pressure of feminism, they have abandoned biblical accuracy in favor of the culture. The biblical passages on women's roles are being culturally reinterpreted, ignored because of the alleged anti-female bias of the biblical authors, or dismissed as the additions of later redactors. The ultimate source of those attacks, of course, is the archenemy of God, Satan. His goal, as always, is to overthrow God's plan and corrupt his design. He is behind the effort to entice women away from their God-created roles in society, in the family, and in the church. Such a sat satanic enterprise is not new. In fact, it was an issue in the church at Ephesus because it was an issue in the Roman world of that time. This isn't new. In a church plagued with false doctrine and false leaders, it is not surprising to find them struggling over gender roles, end quote. So let's go ahead and examine carefully what the Bible teaches on this matter so that we do not need to be confused. Turning back now to our text, let's go ahead and begin reading at verse nine. And we'll begin our exposition at verse 11. Verse nine, likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. Now that we already covered last week. Verse 11 goes on. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Now let's just go ahead and stop right there. Now starting at verse 11, we move from a consideration of the woman's adornment for attendance at public worship to a consideration of her position in the worship service. Also in verse 11, we will notice that Paul has shifted from the plural women to the singular a woman, now specifying each and every woman individually instead of all woman, women as a class. He says a woman must quietly receive instruction. The phrase 
must receive instruction, leaving out the word quietly for the moment, comes from a verb in the present tense, stressing the ongoing and continuous nature, nature of the action being called for. The verb is in what we call the imperative mood, which is the mood of command. And this makes the compliance of this obligatory. It's a command. Quietly and submissiveness, those two words, outline the sphere in which the command is to be carried out. The word quietly there means just that. It means without disturbance. The emphasis seems to be toward the quietness of a life free from contention, confusion, controversy, and even self-assertion. Women are not to become embroiled in the controversies of leadership and doctrinal debate, but to come to worship with a heart quieted by the peace of Christ and attuned to the spirit of Christ through the word of God that's being taught by the leadership of the church. And that this was not merely a command of expediency given to overcome a problem that was unique to Ephesus is very clear from Paul's similar instruction to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 14.34, we read the following. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, assuming that they're married, for it is improper for a woman to speak in the church. Now, Timothy, because of his relationship to the Corinthian church and his assistance to Paul in ministry there, would have been well aware of that instruction. Now, I'll elaborate on what silence does and does not mean in just a moment, okay? But for now, I wanna just look at the word submissiveness there in verse 11. The word submissiveness is a compound word from two words, obviously compound word, from the word meaning under and a word meaning order, under order. So it's a word that bespeaks authority and submission. It was a military term which described the ranks of soldiers arranging themselves under the leadership of their commander. Now, the phrase learn quietly contrasts with the word teach in verse 12. While the phrase entire submissiveness corresponds to the words or the phrase in verse 12 to have authority over a man. In verse 12, Paul actually interprets the meaning of verse 11. He defines exactly what he means by women staying quiet in the worship. Look at verse 12 real quick. He continues, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to be quiet or to remain quiet. So women are to keep quiet in the sense of not teaching. They are to demonstrate subjection by not usurping the authority of the leadership, the elder, the, the, the preacher. Now the command here is not for mindless submission or the surrender of independent thought or abandoning personal discernment. Nor does this imply a second class rank for women within the church. Rather, it assumes the fuller teaching of scripture regarding the absolute authority of God and how he has chosen to delegate measured portions of that authority in, within certain institutions. For example, as he has designated in government, church, and even in the home. And to certain people within those institutions, such as rulers or elders or husbands and fathers. And he did this for the illustrating of the respective roles 
of the Trinity and the purposes of redemption and for the outworking of his redemptive plan among humanity. Think about 1 Corinthians 11.3, which says, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of a woman and God is the head of Christ. Women are not the sole subjects of such authority. For every life, every human life, every life period comes under such authority in some sphere. Citizens to their rulers, wives to their husbands, children to their parents, slaves to their masters, and even the younger to the older. Authority and submission are part of the fabric of life as God has created it for us. And this authority is always relative because only God possesses absolute authority. Such authority is always accountable to God's absolute authority and each one will answer to him for their use of the authority that he has delegated. The apostle here makes clear that God intends the leadership within the local church to be comprised of qualified males. And we'll get to those qualifications uh, pr probably next week. In which case I will be the one up here who's squirming <laughs> as we go through that list of qualifications. The women of the congregation, like the non-male elders, are to follow the lead of those God-given leaders. Now there is a sense in which all members of the body teach one another, as we read in Colossians 3, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs when they, when they worship, right? But as it is used here, there is an official sense attached to the word teaching. The content was sacred and the duty divinely given. This activity of teaching, Paul says, I do not allow women to exercise in the gathered congregation, assuming, of course, that men would be present. The phrase there, do not allow, makes this prohibition absolute and categorical. This prohibition against women teaching and exercising authority is not universal, it's restricted to their relationship with men. Women are instructed elsewhere to teach one another. In Titus chapter, chapter two. And the women, and the ministry of women teaching children is commended. This does not prohibit women from speaking at all. For all women are allowed to pray and to prophesy in the public services of the church, according to 1 Corinthians 11:5. The apostles' instruction to women is that they not teach or exercise authority in the gathered church as a whole, but it says there, but to remain quiet. And so this helps to fill out our understanding of verse 11 when we look at verse 12. Thus, as I said earlier, quietness and entire submissiveness in verse 11 corresponds to teach or exercise authority over a man in verse 12. The submissiveness called for in verse 11 is specifically detailed in verse 12 as not teaching men in the gathered church or exercising authority over them. One writer said, no woman may step into the place of the man without violating the very word she would try to teach to both men and women. It's very quiet in here. <laughs> now, these verses raise many questions concerning their appropriate application in the church today. One lesson we learn is that standing before God's people with God's word and speaking on his behalf is a far more serious matter than perhaps many Christians understand. Something unique from all other human communication is taking place in those instances. 
When we reduce the significance of God's word being taught to God's people, we open the door to sentiments such as, you know, well, what's the big deal? What's the big deal concerning any divine restrictions upon that act? Not only must we answer the individual questions that arise from the apostles' words here, but we must examine our understanding and attitude toward the proclamation of God's word when his people gather for worship. I mean, think of it this way. Anybody can be a pastor today, right? All you need is a blog. How many people have a flock following them who just simply write a blog? We may not even know the individual's anything about the individual at all other than what they're writing on the blog. What are we expecting to take place in the moments when God's word is being taught? Now, by way of specific application, I again want to assert that women may pray and prophesy among God's gathered people. As I also said, women are charged with teaching one another and commended for teaching children. A married woman may serve alongside her husband in private counsel and instruction. Priscilla was not out of place when she and her husband helped the learned Apollos to know the way of the Lord more accurately. Any restrictions imposed here by the apostle are not statements regarding the worth of women. For he elsewhere asserts in the strongest terms the equality of women and men before God as creatures of dignity, worth, significance, and spiritual standing. The members of the Trinity who are co-equal in glory and divinity each functioned within particular roles for the outworking of redemption. Jesus had no problem being under the absolute authority of his Father. Similarly, in a reflection of that equality and diversity within the Godhead, God has ordained that male and female, created equally in dignity and worth, will best fulfill his redemptive purposes and most beautifully reflect his own nature by fulfilling distinct, though equally significant, roles within the church and home. It's very important to realize that. Now, as we move on to verse 13, Paul will now provide a two-fold foundation for his statements regarding women in the gathered church. The first word of verse 13, the word for, signals that a causal statement is being made. The apostle takes us all the way back <clears throat> to the beginning of the human race, and establishes a pre-fall reason for his instructions regarding women in the congregation. He says, first of all, <clears throat> for it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And then he adds, verse 14, and it was not Adam who was deceived, <clears throat> excuse me, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Starting with the first foundation there in verse 13, he states, for it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. <clears throat> now, there's a popular view today, <clears throat> and that is that the woman's subordinate role is a corruption of God's perfect design that was the result of the fall. And since the effects of the curse are intended to be reversed in Christ, it is argued differing male and female roles should be abolished. Paul, however, establishes women's subordinate role not in the fall, but in the divine order of original creation. Upon the creation of the man and the woman, he pronounced it all very good. It was God's good pleasure <clears throat> that Adam who was first created, and it was his, mil, his God's will to make man first. Now, Adam is not mentioned here as first 
in the human race, even though he was, but rather first in relationship to the creation of Eve. Paul's teaching here was not prompted by some cultural situation at Ephesus, and hence not applicable today, as some would argue. He not only appeals here to the creation account in Genesis 2, but also taught this same truth to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 8 and 9, where it says this, For man does not originate from women, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Apart from these New Testament applications of the scriptural record of God's order of creation, one might conclude that the order carries no special or abiding significance. But the Apostle Paul's spirit-directed application confirms what was in God's heart as he formed the first male and female as he did. The female's equal share in the redemption purchased by Christ and in the liberation wrought by Christ does not abolish or alter God's intended design for the sexes as established in creation. Rather, salvation in Christ restores both male and female to a place where they are able to fulfill those God-designed roles. The order of creation communicates something significant and enduring about the roles the male and female are to fulfill in accomplishing God's good and perfect will. It's a, it, it accentuates <clears throat> the distinctiveness that God has created in creating man and woman. Moving on, he says in verse 14, the second reason for his instruction regarding women teaching and exercising authority, he says, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So this reason moves out of the pre-fall state of creation to the fall itself. The statement is, is blunt, it is emphatic. Paul says it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being beguiled fell into transgression. Now both Adam and Eve sinned. No question about that. But what Adam did, he did of his own choice. Quite aware of the magnitude of the sin that he was voluntarily committing. But Eve was completely, thoroughly deceived. In fact, in the Genesis story, only Eve is the one who pleads the excuse of being the victim of deception. The definite article there, the woman, marks her out specifically, not as distinct from all other women, but as the woman, the first, the prototype, the head of all women that fell into this transgression. And as such, Eve fell into transgression, a word that pictures sin in relation to law, as an overstepping of a known requirement. Now, God had given Adam clear instruction concerning what he could and could not eat. We know that. It says that in Genesis 2. <clears throat> it is equally clear that this instruction had come to Eve and she understood it. For the serpent questioned God's word to her, to her face and she recounted God's requirement. She altered it a little bit, <clears throat> but she did recount it. So she did have an understanding of it. Whether God delivered the commandment to the woman directly or mediated it through Adam, she understood what he had demanded, what God had demanded. And as a result of her exercise of unwarranted leadership, she fell into sin and then led Adam into it. Now we might infer that Adam failed to take the leadership necessary to dispel the deception and to resist the serpent. While Eve was deceived, Adam knowingly transgressed God's command. 
Eve knew she was violating God's command, but was deceived regarding the nature of God and his promised judgment. Adam knew God's nature and the inevitability of judgment, and yet he followed his wife's lead <clears throat> right into it. Now, in saying what Paul is saying in verse 14, Paul was not attempting to relieve Adam of responsibility. For he traced the universal effects of the fall back to Adam. In fact, we're going to look at that in just a few moments. But Eve's deception by the serpent and her subsequent enticement of Adam into sin were a powerful influence upon Adam. The serpent slyly bypassed Adam, the head of the couple, and addressed the woman directly. She bypassed the natural order of leadership by listening to the serpent and refusing to direct him back to the man, and Adam allowed her to do so. So having fallen into sin herself, she enticed Adam to follow her lead. Remember, <clears throat> God said to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, God indicated that the aftermath of such decisions would be a continuing struggle for leadership outside of God's appointed pre-fall design. You can read about that in Genesis 3.16. So headship by the man then was part of God's design from the beginning. And this is why man, by Adam, bared the responsibility for its success or failure. The tragic experience of the garden encounter with the serpent confirmed the wisdom of that des design. It confirms the wisdom of that design as the husband being head. <clears throat> this is why the New Testament relates the fall to Adam's sin and not Eve's. And so we would do well to heed this warning as we wrestle with the complexities of the issues and the emotions that surround the role of women in the gathered church. But there's no question about it. Women are not called to be the dispensers of biblical truth in the assembly. Now, I've been to churches before that have had women pastors. And the teaching that they gave on those particular occasions was not unbiblical. <laughs> they knew the word and they were even rightly dividing the word that they were teaching at the time. Does that mean that it's okay? No. They're in the wrong place. They shouldn't be in that, serving in that capacity. <clears throat> Regardless of what our culture is saying right now about gender and the confusion over it, to the degree that we barely know whether someone who was actually born male is actually a male. I mean, you gotta understand, this is only getting worse as time goes on. The ability to, to cut through the fog and to see clearly is getting harder and harder and harder. <clears throat> but as Christians, we have, to, we have to stand firm on this. Now, I, I stuck a paper out there. I saw a couple of them were taken. There's a Nashville statement out there, document that I put out there that you guys are welcome to take. <clears throat> it's a statement that was uh, a statement about what we affirm about human sexuality and what we deny about human sexuality. I would encourage you to grab a copy of that, take it home and read it. It's excellent. I'm, I signed it. <clears throat> but it's right out there in the foyer. You can see it. It's free. Everything out there in those little slots are free. You can check that out on your own. But <clears throat> to help us move into our time of communion right now, I'd like us to turn to Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> We're not done with the women. I know I stopped short of verse 15. Some of you may have been hoping I covered that today, but we're not going to. <clears throat> partly because I want to have enough time for us to be thinking about what we need to think about as we move into communion. 
As I said earlier, one might think from what we just read in verse 14, you guys are going to hand out communion. You want to go ahead and do that? And, and uh, why don't we go ahead and have the band come on up here now and let you guys get settled in, those of you that are going to be leading us in song here momentarily. <clears throat> We don't want to be confused about the fact that God held Adam accountable as the head. And the scriptures make that very clear about how all of us are condemned in Adam. Adam is the federal head of humanity. We've sinned in Adam even, and we have sinned ourselves as well. <clears throat> Sin has been imputed to us and we commit it as well but I want us to take a look at what God provides as that remedy and many of you already know this look at chapter 5 <clears throat> verse 6 it says for while we were still helpless at the right time Christ died for the ungodly Aren't those great words right there? For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps, thank you, brother, though perhaps for the good man, someone would even, would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sinned into the world, entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So you see there it's imputed and we actually committed the act. For until the law, sin was, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. And that's speaking of Christ. <clears throat> but notice verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin, sin entered into the world, and of course we all know who that one man is that it's referring to, that one man is Adam. And yet we just read in verse 14 of 1 Timothy 2 that, well, Eve was deceived and therefore fell into transgression. But Adam was the head. Adam was the one ultimately responsible ultimately in charge. But, look at verse 15 of Romans 5. <clears throat> but the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died, which we all did in Adam, right? Much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. Man, if Adam and Eve could have only known the trouble they were bringing on the universe by that one decision, isn't that amazing? But on the other hand, the free, but on the other hand, excuse me, the free gift arose from many transgressions 
resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more. I love the fact that it just keeps saying much more. How much greater? Much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. <coughs> Excuse me, isn't that encouraging? Look at the next verse. <clears throat> For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one the many will be made righteous. So, <clears throat> there's the fall the picture of the fall, horrifying to even consider what has happened because someone caved in to the enemy after a very clear understanding of what God expected, of what God intended, and here we are. Here we are, celebrating today <clears throat> the means by which God sent to eradicate the effects of the fall. So we are brought back to a restorative place <clears throat> where we are reconciled to God. The roles for the man and the woman have not changed. The original designed, as God designed it pre-fall, that role has not changed. The problem is, is the conflict that is now the result of that sinful choice that our father and mother made, Adam and Eve made, thousands of years ago. That's the problem. We're now living <clears throat> under the shadow, under the black cloud of that choice that they made to reject God's command. The harmony that existed would have existed had Adam and Eve continued on in God's perfect plan. I mean, that's no sense in even speculating that. But the way God designed it, God said it was good. And there was a co-regency there. <clears throat> Both man and woman were to rule over creation. So, I know that sometimes this can be an unpopular subject. I remember one time many years ago, I was talking to a husband and a wife. I was doing some marriage counseling. And I was talking about how <coughs> the Bible teaches that a wife is to be submissive to her husband. Went to Ephesians 5 read from Ephesians 5. She immediately shot back to me, oh, so what, I'm supposed to just let him trample all over me? Where, where did we get that from? <clears throat> no, read what this says. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. No trampling there if the husband's doing what he's called to do, right? But we, we, we need to understand that in our culture, there's always a resistance to do things God's way, right? We know that. That's what the flesh wants to do. The flesh wants to do its own thing <clears throat> in, in, against all of God's commands. Sometimes some people are just more choosy about which commands they're, they're going to decide they're going to usurp. But God's ways are always good. And we're celebrating the goodness of God today in the partaking of this bread and this cup. Because God's goodness brought a remedy to us. God's goodness provided his son Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for our sins, a penalty that we owed, that should have been demanded from us. <clears throat> and God took upon, the Lord Jesus took upon himself that penalty. And we enter into eternal life because of what Jesus Christ did on that cross. You get tired of hearing that? That amazing truth that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom we all are chief. Why don't we pray together and let's ask God 
to bless our time of communion. Let's thank him. Father in heaven, we thank you right now for your graciousness, for your goodness. What a good, good God you are. And Lord, we don't want to we don't want to resist your good design. We don't want to stand in opposition to the way you, you created things to work, created things to function. We know there was a fall. We know <clears throat> that there, there, there is a, a corruption of the goodness that you created. And Lord, we want to get as close to that original goodness as we can. And we thank you, Lord, for the power of redemption that translate us, translates us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for giving these, these symbols to remind us of the price that was paid to bring about that translation. And so Lord, we take this and we do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, let's eat together. And let's drink together. And let's thank our King. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Stand, sit. Let's worship our King.
Lord, the things of this world, Lord, the, the pressure of what other people think, but Lord, that we would love you, Lord, that we would love your word, and Lord, that, that would be the only thing that concerns us. But help us to live for you, Lord, give us the strength, the grace, please, God, in Jesus' name.